start with the conference. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, for those who were here yesterday, welcome back to this second meeting of conferences which Interni has organized with Ital Cementi. Today we're presenting one of the most important countries uh, on the international scene and uh, architect Zanke from uh, St Standard Architects. Now China of course is a somewhat complex country and let me read uh, and quote from an article written by Alberto Albazino written 14 years ago in 1998 following uh, a visit of his to the city of Beijing and uh, the title was Beijing uh, a city full of monsters he wrote I quote the night for a phenomenology or a physiology of authentic Keech. Uh, and what we see here is more than what w was seen in Paris and uh, Rome when uh, sections of the cities were uh, demolished at the end of the 1800s. The demolitions that have occurred in Beijing and uh, lead to uh, curiosity and anguish. Albazino wonders how is it possible for human minds to invent such as atrocious physical structures and then the interiors that are so outrageously uh, flamboyant that lead to compromises that would be unbelievable there have been projects and what see what it seems is that there was no thought behind the project. So after these many years, unquote, after uh, all these years, the words of Arbazino, of course, are no longer uh, applicable because China has followed um, other approaches. And therefore, what we have seen over the past 10 years is uh, a new landscape in uh, Chinese architecture with new approaches and courses taken. And uh, these have changed China, the China of today, into uh, something like an international laboratory uh, for contemporary architecture. Among these various approaches, some which have not been uh, uh, visited by uh, critique, there is one very silent approach uh, made uh, up of made by uh, young uh, Chinese architects, and uh, Mr. Zanke is here uh, today this afternoon. Uh, he is a member of this uh, new generation of architects. Uh, Zanke studied at Harvard in the U.S. and then went back to China. So architects who are citizens of the world and who have overcome the first response which China provided uh, in along its path to economic development, architects who are trying to uh, respond with quality and they are promoting a research which is more careful in trying to uh, interpret the ancient traditions of the habitat of their own country and combining history with contemporary style uh, with care for the environment and uh, with suggestions in China in this fast growing economy uh, some contemplative and reflexive architecture. Standard architecture uh, with Mr. Zanke and his other partners was established in 2001 and uh, it is a laboratory of architects uh, with experiences in Europe and uh, the US and China and Mr. Zanke is present this year uh, at an event organized at the University of Milan uh, by interiors with a project that will be presented this afternoon uh, in his lecture. 
and other projects of uh, Mr. Zenke, uh, some in Tibet, a wonderful landscape, a difficult country, uh, and the Garden of Meditation, the contemplation garden that uh, refers to this idea of rethinking and reproposing. In fact, uh, today's presentation and lecture is entitled Rethinking Basics. Um, buongiorno. Uh, it's uh, nice to be here. My, uh, as you can see, um, my, uh, the topic is about rethinking basics. Um, I think uh, this is something that uh, uh, I can uh, start with and then it, it could be uh, uh, better to help uh, you to understand uh, uh, my architecture uh, because um, as I'm going to show it will be uh, you will see uh, quite a few um, um, realized projects uh, from product design to architecture to landscape um, but they might seem in terms of form it's uh, extremely different um, but I, I think it's all relating to um, asking uh, questions, uh, more basic questions nowadays. Um, I think um, um, all generations of architects, um, uh, when you um, start to redefine your ideas, your generation, it always uh, depends on how you go back to the basic questions and because the, the, the questions are mostly there but uh, the answers, uh, how you reply the answer in a different way as uh, in relating to the contemporary uh, uh, culture and uh, world uh, uh, will make you different uh, from the former generations. Um, also the question has to relate to both uh, social changes and, uh, and uh, the technical changes. Um, so, so let's see how um, you, I will show you uh, in my realized projects and some of the crazy ideas. Um, I would like to start with our first baby. Um, this uh, was built in 2004. When I first uh, started, um, I had a lot of uh, anger. I, I had a lot of uh, hatred. I hated uh, other architects uh, in China. I hated some of the international architects. Uh, I hated uh, my clients also. So <laughs> because of the culture of uh, that time, um, the architects uh, in China or practicing in China, they either just do uh, buildings uh, without a re relation to the country, or they simply dig out uh, uh, old Chinese stuffs and uh, try to uh, you know dig them out of the grave and sell it uh, abroad. So the part of the reason I call my off studio a standard architecture as one word. Um, yeah, by the way, it's a standard no dash architecture one word, um, is because I like it uh, to be a neutral. It doesn't reply, imply to any specific uh, forms. And, and um, you know, it, uh, it can be uh, uh, re-questioning the basic uh, so that we have a different answer. This was uh, designed uh, in extremely quick uh, because uh, uh, I did it in two weeks, the design. Um, it was an auditorium for elementary school in Beijing. And the developer took the land from the school. So as a, as a payback, uh, they, they gave two million RMB to the school, um, hoping that uh, the, to build uh, this uh, 400 seats auditorium. I think it's, uh, the auditorium is actually bigger than this space. Um, but we only had uh, 2 million RMB uh, budget, which is extremely small. So in 
this building, I wanted to test uh, that um, that that people are reading it. A lot of people are reading it as um, as uh, a contemporizing uh, Chinese uh, traditional big uh, roof forms. In in fact, it's really a, a not. It's really. Uh, more cynical to this approach, uh, as was uh, very popular in China. E even now, uh, it, it's quite popular. Um, so for us, it's more of a, a gesture of uh, um, confrontation. This is the old uh, um, uh, school building. And also, it, I started from section, because this is the slope that uh, that the auditorium requires, and this is the stage, and this is the lobby. It's very simple, but um, and um, you know the question is: uh, usually buildings are composed of uh, roofs and walls. Here, I didn't want to do it, uh, so the roof and the wall merges to be only one element. It's hard to tell where's the roof and where's where's the wall. It's funny because when it's first built uh, and the parents um, don't want to let their children to stand here because they feel that the wall is going to uh, s uh, fall down. But of course it will not happen because uh, we played a little structural trick. Um, there was a big uh, concrete uh, wall underground uh, to balance it. So it's, uh, it's not going to fail. Um, the, the plan is extremely simple because, uh, as you can see, it's a typical auditorium building with toilets, but uh, we, we carefully shipped, shipped it to off-center so it's not totally symmetrical. That's the only thing uh, we did uh, of a typical auditorium building. Um, it's very rough. It's, it, it served uh, as, a, as a message to the Chinese uh, um, architectural world that, uh, so be careful, we are coming with hatred. The second building um, we did uh, was this, um, also very quick, uh, it was this um, um, showroom in Wuhan. Uh, it was done in 2005. Um, so the the client, the developer, asked uh, us to do a bigger showroom, and uh, the question was, okay, you have to do a building that uh, embody all the history, intellectual history of China, and also re remembering all the intellectuals that lives across the street from this neighborhood and the memory of the city, of course. It's too much burden. It's impossible. So I choose to um, play a little around. Um, I did um, this uh, ink and water exercise. So as a reference to the intellectual uh, practice. Um, of course, it's, um, it's it started as uh, one um, one big uh, rectangular space, but uh, halfway uh, in the design, I found out uh, that uh, there's uh, this 30 meter wide um, um, flooding pipe underground, uh, so we cannot, uh, we're not allowed to build anything. So uh, in this way, our building were almost killed, uh, but then I thought, well, maybe I can just let it happen. So I let this, uh, invisible infrastructure cutting my building into two parts, the east hall and the west hall. Of course, to link them, I need to have a 80 meter long uh, footbridge uh, floating in the air. And the ink and water sketch was very easy. It was done in two minutes, but then for the next uh, three months, uh, we were suffering for the structure. And in the beginning, nobody believed that uh, this structure can work. But then I did uh, a lot of models. Uh, it feels very strong, <laughs> even with the history books over it. Um, so, but then we need to find a, a reasonable structural uh, uh, format for it. 
I asked my structural uh, engineer, a PhD also from Tsinghua. I said, uh, maybe we can think of it as, um, um, you know, if hollow beam, because if you think of it as a truss, it breaks the randomness of the, of the ink and water pattern. Or if you think of a frame, it doesn't work because it cannot be as thin as we want it. So in the end, we did it in a, a very regularly layout uh, scheme, but we just reinforced the weakest point. And it's a hollow beam. The construction uh, process. So the the this uh, floating uh, footbridge is uh, 80 meter long, and there's uh, in the middle there's this 32 meter uh, cantilever, and the thickness of the of the uh, wall is only 200 uh, centimeters. Um, it's uh, quite unexpected because uh, I, I thought it could be nice to have this ink and water uh, effect, uh, but I never thought uh, it can be uh, this nice. And then <clears throat> the next building is done in 2007. Um, it's a building that um, in, in Sichuan province, uh, it's, uh, it's a developer friend, he has this land, um, he asked, he come to me, ask uh, if you are able to do a building for me, 500 square meters, I don't know what it is. And I said, okay, if you don't have a program, let's call it a tea house, because usually if you don't have a program, it's called tea house in China, or maybe in Japan too. Um, so it's a tea house. Um, I wanted to play because in Chengdu the weather is very humid. Um, and then the traditional uh, courtyard houses, they always have to uh, have uh, open to the air space. There's not a distinction between indoor space and outdoor space. It's all open to the air. So, but I, I don't want to do the courtyard in a traditional way. I want to, to have... Uh, maybe five courtyards uh, squeezed together, like in parties, they dance very close to each other. So, and then I imagine the in-between space can be uh, nice. So this is the plan, and the tea house with terraces on the water. And the roof is uh, quite traditional. Uh, it's inwardly pitched, um, which uh, happens in, in China. And uh, in terms of material, I found this stone, which is a, a kind of a, sign, a sandstone um, uh, in, the, in the city, uh, in the mountains really nearby, which uh, is um, quite uh, a bit soft. Uh, it absorbs a lot of water uh, easily. And then, because the weather in Chengdu is quite wet and humid, uh, so I hope uh, that uh, after a few years it can grow moss on it, uh, so it has uh, this green um, um, moss growing on it. And uh, actually it worked after three years now. So this is the progress. So you see these are the uh, stone uh, tubes. Um, here on the outside, it's, uh, it's very uh, abstract. Oh, are we able to turn off the light? Um, night views. The first courtyard without roof. So we made uh, very um, detailed uh, uh, geometrical models, but uh, Actually, I really don't know how to solve the structural problem. So I invited a carpenter of uh, in Sichuan um, to um, work with us uh, to figure out the structure. And he did it quite nice. I only asked him uh, one requirement that I uh, 
don't want to have any columns. Uh, usually traditional houses, they will have two columns uh, adjacent to the patio. I, I gave him a challenge to remove the columns. So in the end, uh, he did it uh, quite nice in the end. It's, you know, it's traditional, but it's not uh, just a simply copy of the traditional framework. So it's more like installation in, in the space. And the first uh, court chart uh, twisted. Um, it's uh, quite uh, interesting. And then the next uh, project uh, is um, is in Suzhou. Um, it's all in whitewashed uh, walls. I, I, I started the project in 2007. Um, is um, after visiting uh, Mr. I.M. Pace building, museum building in Suzhou. Actually, I hated uh, the building also because he, what he did uh, was uh, he made, uh, took a traditional Suzhou garden um, and then made it uh, more abstract in geometry, but he still have a lot of the decorations and uh, 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 you know the the flower shaped uh, windows and things which i don't think it's pure so but i made a little joke because he he said uh, i want to make a building that's uh, spiritually chinese but visually utmostly contemporary i said well why don't we do the opposite can we make a building in suzhou which is spiritually modern, but maybe in the look you can see a little bit of Chineseness. So I started uh, by saying that uh, Suzhou Garden is about whitewashed walls and uh, endless uh, uh, of uh, courtyards, uh, maybe a little bit water. So I did a 500 meter long white wall, uh, nine meter high, zigzag, and to form a series of uh, courtyards. So, and rationalize it a little bit. This is it. Um, it has a lot of programs. It's about 3,000 square meters. It has a showroom, restaurant, old people's club, uh, uh, a, a children's uh, kindergarten, everything. But outside is uh, very abstract. Uh, we also did the landscape. So as a, as a reaction to, to a attitude towards a, a, a tradition and history, I think for the younger generation, we, we, we are not avoiding tradition, but I think we don't want to have the full burden of it uh, so um, that uh, we, can, we can deal with it uh, more freely without losing uh, the, 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 the sense of uh, modernity. And this is a little crazy, but it's a real project so I did um, in 2007. Mm. It's called the Dancing Books Tower. It's actually um, a, a housing. Uh, it has two towers. Um, one is, um, one is uh, uh, 400 square meter per, per floor, uh, um, uh, one unit per floor uh, suite. Uh, the other is uh, social housing. It's a five unit per floor as required by the government that for 52% of the housing has to be social housing. So this tower is luxury houses. Each floor is one house, 400 square meters. This is a social housing. As you can see, I call it the dancing books towers. It's not that tall, it's about 150 meters high is, uh, it's just very thin. It's like uh, one of these pencil towers uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, we've, you see uh, there are 50 floor plans. Um, each one is slightly different. And the section and the social housing part, uh, five units per floor. Um, we finished all the construction documents, actually, and then they started construction in 2009. Of course, it was uh, 
on hold because of the financial crisis. And the next tower, but also I want to say that it's also going back to the, to the basic questions because as you can see, nowadays we no longer need to look at towers only from bottom up. So verticality is no longer so important to us. Uh, I, because it's our first tower, I wanted to explore the horizontal freedom of, uh, of uh, skyscrapers. Um, this is um, 2007 uh, for Hong Kong Biennale. It's not a real project. Uh, it, uh, we were invited to do a proposal for the West Kowloon, which uh, um, um, uh, Norman Foster did a big canopy cover the whole island, which was uh, very controversial. And I also hated that proposal because it doesn't work with the weather. Um, so our question is, uh, is it possible to bring our agriculture back to the urban center as a new form of uh, urbanization? Of course, nowadays it's no big uh, new thing, but in 2007, it was, it was uh, quite new at the time. So our proposal was about uh, if you, it, this uh, West Kowloon is totally uh, built out of a, a landfill, and they wanted to build these a dozen uh, cultural uh, uh, institutions like uh, theaters and um, um, museums, but it doesn't make sense because uh, the city cannot sustain it financially because you spend billions of dollars to do the landfill and then you build the cultural institution that city taxpayers still need to pay more money to, to sustain it. So my proposal is more of saying that why don't we build a 500 meter tall department store for, for shopping, which uh, as you know, most Chinese uh, from mainland to go to Hong Kong for shopping. And then you have these uh, cultural institutions uh, embedded on the mountain. So uh, that was a quick idea. It's not that serious, but to, to raise the question. It's funny because I found um, these, um, this, uh, later in the year, I found this farmer to, uh, in Shaoxing, China. He planted uh, rice on his uh, four-story building roof, uh, and he harvested uh, about 150 kilograms of, uh, of rice. So the farmers are really intelligent, sometimes uh, better than city planners. And then this was a, uh, part quickly done by uh, in 2010 for Audi Urban Future Award project because Audi invited me to do, uh, together with a few uh, European architects, uh, to think about urban future. I took uh, Beijing as an example. Um, in 2010, I did a research, uh, found out that uh, at the time, Beijing had uh, about uh, 4.5 million cars, and the, the increasing speed was uh, 1 million car increase per year. So. So one year, the city will have one million more cars. It's going to have traffic jam, or it already had a traffic jam for the ring roads. As you know, Beijing, for the whole uh, city, has the second ring, third ring, fourth ring, fifth ring, sixth ring. But then all the ring roads are every day as millions of cars uh, Guess getting stuck on it, burning gas without move, moving. So I said, okay, if it's like this, why don't we have the road move uh, instead of having cars moving on it, uh, uh, burning gas, uh, polluting our air? So let's uh, move the road so that you can almost park your car on the road and then you get out of your car and talk to the people next to your car and get to know more people. Of course, I also designed uh, these uh, little Audi bubbles um, so that uh, because uh, if you drive your car, you just need uh, this uh, cabin. So the back of it is uh, fully devoted to uh, uh, passengers. So all the cars, uh, each car will have a space to carry 
uh, strangers in your car so you don't waste energy. At the same time, these uh, will have these uh, magnetic mechan mechanism that you can click them together so it becomes uh, a public uh, bus. Um, so these are ideas and they were fascinated by these ideas. And uh, this was the village mountain. Uh, I did, uh, I, actually the thought started uh, last year. It's related to, to the arable land laws in China because I think for the new generation, we cannot just do what our clients uh, commission us to do as buildings. Uh, we have to think of what's happening to our uh, resources and uh, environment. I did the research very quick uh, in, that uh, showed in the past 15 years in China, we lost 8% of arable land, which, is, which counts as uh, 150 million Chinese acres of land, which means that we lost the capability of raising 100 million population. With the world population just reached uh, um, um, seven billion recently, and then it's going to become uh, ten billion soon. So we are raising this question: Are we going to our urban expansion? Are we going to uh, take uh, more land uh, as uh, we did in the past 15 years? And, and uh, do we have a solution, or do we have an alternative way of urbanizing? countryside. As you know, in the next uh, five years, China is going to invest uh, 4,000 billion RMB for the countryside development. So I'm very afraid that uh, this is going to demolish or uh, eat up more arable land. So the idea is to pile up the villages. So each mountain will have uh, about uh, five, six villages, and which take only the space of one village. And each family will get, still get to, to build their own house in their own style. So it can be a very uh, traditional Chinese uh, uh, houses or modern flats, uh, whatever. Um, I know that it's not something that we can solve the problem, but I think it's important to raise the question of uh, land use and land, farmland conservation as a, as a metaphor to raise the question. Of course, um, as you know, in China, we always have uh, this uh, intellectual desire of living in the mountains, uh, which is all, always depicted in the landscape drawings and poetries. So maybe this oriental uh, philosophy, interest of living in the mountains can benefit uh, to the future. That's part of the reason I also brought uh, this, uh, these towers uh, to the to the design week, uh, as you can see, uh, the three towers in the Stadale. Um, and the next project, uh, it's more fun. Uh, I call it X of the Cities, um, because uh, Chairman Mao told us uh, to serve the people. But now we have such a strong urbanization process. We have uh, 200 million migrant people in the city. They don't have fixed place, or they have problem with their living place. So I put uh, my serve the migrant people, and people laugh at me, saying, "How dare you put your name before Chairman Mao?" Um, so the city is expanding. It's get it's actually getting more fancy, but it is deteriorating. It laid three eggs to save the world. And these are not just eggs, um, they have um, functions to help young people to find a, a place to stay, but also to uh, make a temporary uh, living. So it can be vendor's house, uh, breakfast stands, uh, fruit uh, house, uh, etc. So it's for these people we are thinking. It's for these, these. And these people in the city, they're always chased by the uh, security and policemen. They, are, they don't, usually they're, they don't have a, they felt like they're illegal, but you know, these people has right to live in the city. 
So we created a, a few real ones. The first one is a bench house. On the front is a bench in the public. On the back is a temporary shelter. And the eggs are really mixing with the public. The second one is a karaoke egg house. So um, we have a small karaoke uh, inside, uh, and then the idea is uh, the young people can take care of the karaoke, and passerby can sing songs um, for one RMB per song. So she or he can make about 200 RMB per per day, which is not bad. So we actually built one for Shenzhen Biennale uh, two years ago. Um, well. This is a passerby. He is curious to, uh, about uh, the egg. And the young people really enjoyed it. The grass is real. It's a real grass. We, I found this uh, film which can be uh, translucent. It has small pockets, so we planted grass in it. So it become a three-dimensional foldable real grass. And it cost us about 800 yuan to, to buy all these uh, karaoke um, super cheap uh, machines. It works quite well. And uh, people are really enjoying it, checking out the grass. I don't know where he came from, but it's, everything is totally intuitive. The policeman is also very curious. So on the back uh, is uh, Rem Kuhas's uh, stock exchange building. It's a bit ironical. He's really passing by. I give uh, him my uh, uh, certificate uh, to stay there. So. Um, and it's uh, funny because uh, one of the students who, who uh, worked uh, uh, in my office, uh, in my studio on the uh, egg project, he, uh, he got an offer to work in my office. He went home, he said, oh my god, my salary is only 4,000 uh, RMB per month. And in Beijing it's so expensive, it takes about 3,000 to rent apartment. I'm not going to survive to work at uh, standard architecture. So he built it, he went home, he built it uh, an egg uh, with bamboo himself. And he sent me pictures. I said, great, uh, you bring it here. So he uh, brought, I, I, I paid him to bring this uh, egg house uh, downstairs from my office. This is my office. And he lives here, he saves the 3,000, and he, it takes him 15 seconds to go to the work. And it's very homey. Um, he can have money to join health club and having money to have coffee and uh, even afford a few more girlfriends. I think it's funny because um, it, 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 it was 2011. When we put this on the internet, it stirred uh, incredible public debate. It became an event uh, w without uh, any plan because, because at the time the housing price in Beijing was ridiculous. It was like uh, 50,000 RMB per square meter and most people cannot afford apartment where then this boy spent uh, 6,400 yuan to build his own house, which is very homey, is, uh, you know, I, we, people see it as an ideal reaction to, to what's happening, that, uh, that, that the government was not able to control the housing price. Um, so his name is Dai Haifei. He became super famous in China. I think uh, it's uh, like 500 million people know his name in China. Uh, he's probably the most ex most well-known architect in China now. And he's still working in my office. I'm, I'm happy. 
Uh, this is a small uh, renovation project of a bookshop and a, a cafe in Beijing, close to our office. I quickly go through it, and then I'll go to the. Oh, I have a few industrial design project uh, to show, and then I go to the Tibetan more serious architecture. Um, this is um, um, a pavilion we designed uh, la end of last year for uh, for a furniture brand uh, in China, and uh, we also did um, a series of uh, concept furnitures um, for them. By these, by doing these, um, again, we're asking more fundamental questions of, uh, about what furniture is about. So we have different answers. For example, this one is about intimacy in the public and bodily landscape. Uh, furniture can be viewed as a piece of landscape, but is closely related to human body. And candy floors uh, really uh, is uh, something that's really uh, floating in the air. We also designed uh, uh, this edge, which is uh, um, about uh, not fixed uh, uh, usage. So, so this is really in the public, but uh, we are really intimate. If you sit on it, it's like uh, sitting on the same bed. Phantom, my daughter. <laughs> Okay, um, the Tibetan projects. Um, s starting 2007, um, we were, w I started to do a series of uh, uh, Tibetan projects. Um, I think uh, it's uh, very challenging for, for me because uh, I was, in the beginning, I was very um, worried uh, because it's a place with strong architectural tradition and uh, and formal tradition so and then and then the culture is very different um, but uh, after these uh, few years I think I learned a lot uh, from working with our client um, uh, Ouyang Xu and uh, Mr. Jingmei Wangzhou uh, from Tibet um, it's one important thing is um, nowadays no matter how um, concepts, ideas, discourses of architecture can be global. Um, we have to realize that architecture, after all, is a local practice. You have to go to build at the spot, at the place. You have to be there. So that's why we have to deal with um, the location, deal with the local culture, local um, uh, craftsmanship um, and local material, probably. Um, this is the first building we um, designed. Um, it's a small boat terminal. The idea is very uh, simple because it's it's the smallest and re remotest uh, um, boat terminal along the Yalun Tsampu River. Um, I found these uh, four big uh, mob, uh, poplar trees. So, of course, everything starts from um, from a ramp because the water level changes about eight meters every uh, in different time of the year. So we have to build a ramp to reach the lowest uh, water level so that the boats, so when the water is low, the boats can park here. And of course, uh, then it's very simple. We, I extended the ramp to go zigzag between the trees. It goes over its own roof, and it goes uh, in between the tree, uh, pop out again on over the river. <laughs> Underneath is very simple. It's a waiting space uh, for, for passengers and the toilet. Here is one room that's prepared for passengers to stay overnight in case the weather went too bad. 
for 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 uh, boats on the river. All the materials uh, is um, very very humble. It's uh, collected from the site. Um, it's a stone. This is the passage going between uh, through itself. This is across the river. So we can see the stone. These are the material, um, the smaller ones we collect to build these. On the back is the mountain, uh, Mount uh, Doshongla, where where you can you you have to go through this uh, terminal to go to the remotest uh, hiking uh, mountains in in Tibet. Plan. So this is the material pallet uh, I, I found uh, from the local villages, the stone. Um, to pr protect the tree. Um, one idea is about material, because uh, it's interesting we talk about uh, architecture at uh, Itachi Mente, because uh, it's related to material. I think uh, one understanding for us is there's no material more contemporary than any other. Um, so although the stones uh, are very humble, but uh, there must be a way that we can build, uh, find a new meaning of uh, the material so that uh, in the end, they form a contemporary architecture. The second building is uh, uh, the visitor center um, we designed uh, in the same year. Uh, it was uh, completed slightly later than the boat terminal. Um, it has a lot of functions, but uh, in the end, the idea is very simple. The building is not uh, thrown there. It's uh, like a few rectangular volume that uh, grow out of the slope. Um, again, all the material is uh, just a local stone. Um, this, um, this wall is about one meter thick. Uh, it's all stone masonry. Mm, we are very careful in opening windows um, so that this, the building looking from outside uh, wouldn't be a uh, too big scale compared to the village buildings. And there, the skylight, um, um, we're lucky because uh, at the region uh, we don't have to do uh, uh, sprinklers, light, lights, uh, or air conditionings and things. Um, so. Uh, only thing we need is light. I put light uh, at the bottom of the vertical windows uh, somewhere here. So the light is cast uh, against this uh, ceiling. So in the night, uh, it's also very uh, clean. So it's, it's more of the ambience, light, and the, and the abstract uh, f um, uh, feeling of the space uh, that uh, we are interested to create. And this I call the stairway to heaven. Uh, storage rooms, uh, uh, internet cafe. Um, you can see, that although it's rough, uh, we have a lot of articulation between the wall and the floor the, for the drainage. And the uh, cute uh, Tibetan pigs. Uh, The opening, the plan, you can see the plan. So the lower part uh, is really buried uh, in the hill. And we have, we have toilets, we have drivers, uh, rest area, small offices, uh, lockers, um, and uh, some um, mechanical space, uh, switch house for the village. So it's also function as a um, um, facility for the whole village. Sections. The progress to build it. It's a heavy earthquake area, so, so, so we have to put some uh, concrete uh, uh, frame in, it, in the wall to stabilize it. 
again, the, the local craftsmen are invited to, to do this pattern because this is something only uh, people from local can are able to do. Um, the next building is a small um, uh, Neon River Visitor Center and uh, um, a, a boat station for, um, what's that, for kayaking. It's, um, it's a very simple uh, courtyard uh, um, with uh, frames of the landscape. But what's really interesting of this building is we, in this building, we use the stone and structural system of, uh, of the traditional uh, Tibetan houses, and which is masonry with wooden structure. There's no concrete uh, frame uh, in it at all. It's totally wooden structure. Um, some of you may have seen the colored version of the courtyard. Um, we tested with the strong colors. In the end, uh, uh, we were cautious of it because, um, as I said from the beginning, to to show respect to a culture is not to to literally use uh, the the decoration or reference of that culture, rather than. It's uh, you know it's maybe the material continuity is um, uh, more subtle rather than a literal copy of the Tibetan culture uh, color. At the same time, we by doing this uh, wipeout uh, as the local people do to their houses, um, we emphasize the structural subtlety uh, of of these uh, stone courtyards. So the space is quite uh, dramatic uh, in all different uh, light uh, conditions. So it's, uh, here we have some boat uh, that, that people can take rest here. This is an office. We also introduced a small medical clinic for the village. And then there is a toilet. The function is very simple. And on the roof, we use traditional, we call it, in Tibet, they call it aga earth. It's the rammed earth uh, for the roof. So plan is very simple. Structure, wooden, wooden beams, the lower part, the upper part. So on this section, you can see it's the, this, and then this is the window detail with the, Inside is there's a hollow space. So um, the building progress you can see is is extremely humble. I think what we want to explore is uh, is it possible to raise the question is it possible to use the most basic way of building to create a completely contemporary buildings, which is relevant to the local culture and local tradition that we are building at in. This is the wood. Um, and this area is, uh, is very rich of the wooden uh, uh, wood uh, timber. So that's why all the traditional houses are constructed with massive wooden beams. This is the construction process. Interior um, progress. Of course, we do have the waterproof before we put the rammed earth. Um, this is the landscape that uh, Matteo mentioned about. I think uh, it's um, it's a project uh, of uh, of um, emotion. Um, I, I just went to the site uh, without uh, having this project uh, in mind uh, at all because the client didn't have the uh, plan of a, of a landscape here. But then the tree is very, um, 
um, impressive, uh, the big tree. It's about 40 meter wide, a mulberry tree, um, over 1,000 year old. And then the canyon is over there, and then with the uh, Nanchapawa snow mountain. Um, it was just a, a, a moment of inspiration that I think, um, you know, it, it, is there a, a possibility of creating a space that to bring all these uh, great natural, uh, natural um, landscape together so that uh, to have a relationship of our mind, of our human body with, um, with the nature and, and for, for meditation. So in a way, it's a tribute of a, a church that tributed to, to nature and ourselves uh, to think of our life, uh, uh, our own existence. It was extremely simple. I just did, what I did was just cleared up the ground, uh, fill out the holes uh, that was there and removed the shrubs and then paved it with, um, with white gravels. And these are the stones existing. Of course, it's like a church. Uh, we provided a little bit of seating. Um, but without the altar, the tree is the thing that you look at and hear from. Sometimes uh, good projects doesn't need to do too much. Um, you know, uh, I think one of the problem of nowadays architecture it could probably is uh, over design. There are too many, too much design in most of the buildings. Um, but uh, sometimes when you do, because you know in China we, we have this Tai Chi. It's, it's more like using the force of the, that exists there, that you push it to the right direction, doing very little, and then you can achieve uh, um, a great uh, creation in as a, a place. So maybe this is the Eastern philo uh, uh, wisdom that uh, may be beneficial to our contemporary architecture. This is a project is still ongoing. It's the biggest uh, boat terminal that we're building on along the Yalantzampu River. Um, we invited a young Portuguese uh, team called Embaixada. Uh, to work uh, with us uh, two, three years ago. We went there um, and then we did a brainstorm together for two weeks and then, and then we were moving it uh, forward uh, with all the uh, facade and programs and things. Um, it's, um, it's coming out quite uh, interesting because in Tibet there's also <clears throat> a relationship of uh, architecture to landscape because I was, uh, I, I had a um, reading of the architecture and landscape in Tibet as everything in Tibet is landscape and every landscape is architecture. So here we're testing that uh, if, um, if we have our buildings uh, zigzag to, to work together with the, with the heel, then at this point we reach uh, a platform of uh, 3,000 meters uh, uh, altitude. And then you can come back to look at uh, the landscape uh, of the river. Inside uh, is a dormitory for boat uh, drivers and uh, a living space uh, for them. <coughs> the the in-between space and these are dormitories with a quite good view. And then you go down, there's a small auditorium underneath So if you go up to this uh, platform, you look to this tremendous uh, uh, landscape of the snow mountain and the river. <clears throat> now here, uh, the reason why we haven't published it is because we are building the uh, second phase uh, here for a waiting space and restaurants of the boat terminal. So this uh, big uh, ramp continues to here and to here goes down all the way to the water level. So you, you, as visitors, you can have two ways of visiting it. You can choose to go 
on the roof and going down to the to the uh, boat, or you can go through an opening and then going directly to the boat. So hopefully in two years it's going to be a completed building. And this is the latest uh, project we just finished uh, end of last year. It's a it's a small uh, art center uh, built at the foot um, on the ground. It, on the lower level is um, is a canteen for tourists and big public toilet. On the above, in, we introduced uh, these uh, free standing blocks of each is a small exhibition space. <coughs> of course, it starts from an uh, um, irregular grid system that uh, evolves uh, in the end. Uh, it's, um, it's like huge rocks that uh, flow down the hill. <coughs> Inside out. Um, skylight. It's interesting because we opened these skylights that uh, even in the daytime, uh, without natural, uh, with, without artificial light, uh, the exhibition can work quite nice. So this is the plan, the grid system, and the second uh, uh, exhibition area. Um, I'll show two, three projects that's ongoing that uh, we're going to build uh, this year and uh, next year. It's uh, a vista point uh, uh, of the meeting point of uh, two uh, major rivers. This is Nyon River and I continue to meet uh, the Yalun Tsongpu. The idea of the vista point usually is um, it's a spot. You go there, you look, you take pictures and you go. We don't want to do this. We want people to see the landscape in movement. So you go up, you see uh, up river, and then you continue down, and then you go back, you look at this way. So you can go uh, in loop. <clears throat> and then there's a way that uh, you can go underneath this uh, to reach the river. Of course, uh, um, it's steel structure. It's going to be steel structure and finished uh, with stone. We uh, finished uh, all the structural calculation, and then we're managing not to have columns. And um, the other project, uh, which is ongoing now, is a small uh, 500 square meter uh, um, uh, spa. Um, it, it, there's a natural uh, spa, uh, spring, hot spring in the in the valley. We lead it out uh, to to the bank of the river. <coughs> so this question also also goes back to what the uh, spa is about. Um, we asked a question that uh, what is the best spa everybody ever had, and then the answer was uh, the best spa we ever had uh, was in our mother's uh, um, womb. So it's a degree of uh, protection. Um, so that the water itself uh, protects you from the wilderness, but you are able to, you feel a great sense of security, but you can look into the landscape uh, through the opening. Again, the, 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 the material will still be local, uh, very humble stone um, with um, um, as a precise uh, construction as uh, we can. The last project I'm going to show, I think uh, I'm okay with time, um, is a house uh, and hostel. Um, in in this uh, landscape uh, that uh, we want to build this thing, usually people want to pop out uh, facing out. We said uh, maybe we can reverse it so we can have a big uh, castle-like uh, space that all the rooms are popping inward and we have a swimming pool in the center. And of course, in between these uh, two big walls, we have the public space and circulation and lobby and stuff. So we have ramp going, linking each of the rooms. 
the good thing is each room will have the world's best view towards the mountain. And they will have a concrete uh, structure with the stone together, and then these are going to be steel structure. The boxes are not windows, they're rooms. They're like, they're, the, each box is a, a scale of a room. So this is ongoing. But, you know, it might be fancy, but in the end, it's a very basic uh, 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 building. This is our space, our new addition of our space. Uh, me, still very angry. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Very well. I believe that Mr. Zhang Kei's presentation was really significant and it shows what a long way China has gone. Uh, they've gone on a different pathway here characterized by quality rather than quantity with different scales and different approaches. We're not only talking about skyscrapers meeting the needs of a growing market, but rather projects that are the product of thoughts and emotions taking the landscape into due consideration with a very close dialogue between landscape and architecture. If you have questions, please feel free to ask them. Mr. Zanke is pleased to answer to any of your questions. Perhaps you want to make a comment. If not, we can meet again tomorrow morning with the Mesa Cucinella's conference. Just outside the room, oh, I can see there is a question. We have seen huge walls. Uh, it, it's a question for the architect. English. Very English. Okay, okay. We've seen a huge uh, thickness in the walls and, and uh, uh, very sustainable materials from the uh, point of view uh, of environments is coming from uh, surrounding areas and local materials. Uh, probably I, I didn't get the beginning. Uh, did you mention anything about heating or cooling systems? Uh, we saw projects in the area of Tibet, which is supposed to be quite cold, and uh, are, are they somehow um, uh, warmed up this uh, the type of architecture? And if, if yes, what type of technology did you uh, foresee? Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, it's uh, about uh, um, um, sustainability, but uh, it's uh, the first boat terminal also used very basic uh, heating. As you can see from the plan, we have a, a fireplace uh, in, in the center. And uh, for the visitor center, because uh, in the winter it's very cold, but in the winter it's closed uh, for the tourist. So in the summer, it's not uh, very um, hot. And then also because in, in this, uh, the sun, we had the skylight facing instead of uh, usually facing north, where we have the skylight facing south. So when there's sunshine, uh, so to collect uh, heat because uh, cooling is never a problem there. So um, also the, the stone wall is very thick. Uh, so. So uh, we're lucky because this area of Tibet we work on is n the weather in from from May from April to October, which is the tourist season, is uh, relatively mild. Uh, so it it's not required to have air conditioning, and the heating is not uh, a requirement either. So thanks for the question. <laughs> Sono altri interventi? Pointo. Um, 
just a um, simple question. The, the humble stone that you are using and the process as well, uh, is it uh, expensive for the uh, construction? No, no, not at all. We use it partially because we don't have a big budget at all. So it's uh, all of them are pretty low budget buildings. So it's uh, collected in in a distance that's uh, shorter than three kilometers. Uh, so it's uh, very cheap, and the labor is uh, very uh, low. Also, the the co cost is not high. So, but it need to think of the structural system. Uh, uh, a lot, so that uh, so that uh, we can make uh, the humble stone fly. For example, with the Neon River building, with the whole wooden structure. So there is some uh, 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 tectonic uh, uh, designs uh, in it to 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 create uh, this uh, almost uh, surreal effect uh, with a very basic uh, uh, structural system. Bene, allora, uh, Very well, I believe that we can conclude today's meeting. As I was telling you before, uh, there will be experts in a white coat waiting for you for a visit to the new iLab of Ital Cementi. So, see you again tomorrow morning at 10. Also, uh, I would like to visit the Moroso showroom uh, at uh, Via Pontaccio, which yeah. I also designed this year, but also with the sofa called uh, Hidden Dragon. Uh, you don't see the dragon. <laughs> Grazie ancora a tutti.